As Fernando mentioned, my name is Jen Tomasoni, and I'm the project coordinator for Get in Motion, which is a physical activity counseling service offered through SCI Action Canada. And today what we're going to be talking about is how you can get in motion in 2013. So as Fernando mentioned, we're going to leave time at the end for questions, but you're welcome to ask questions at any time by using the chat box. So today I'm presenting on behalf of SEI Action Canada, which is a community university research alliance that really aims to promote physical activity to people with spinal cord injury. So it's a, it's a group of researchers as well as community organizations like SCI BC that come together with a common goal. And what our goal or our mission is, is really to develop and mobilize strategies that are going to inform, teach, and enable individuals with spinal cord injury in Canada to initiate and maintain a physically active lifestyle. So as I mentioned, we have a bunch of community partners that work really closely with us. And these people are, are really are the workhorses that get our information out for us. So you may recognize some of the logos or some of the names on the screen. And I particularly want to draw your attention to SCIBC, which you see in the middle there, as well as SCI Ontario and the Canadian Paraplegic Association in Alberta. And these partners have been instrumental over the past couple months in really helping us um, reach people with spinal cord injury. And, and we're so grateful that SCIBC has invited us to be part of this webinar today. So we also have a number of university partners and research facilities where all of the research that SCI Action Canada translates actually takes place. And so you can see I've listed eight of them there. So I'm affiliated with McMaster University and actually SCI Action Canada is run out of McMaster University, but we have research partners all across um, Ontario, we have one in Saskatchewan, and we even have one over in the UK at Lethbrow University. So let me tell you a little bit about why SCI Action Canada is so passionate about sharing physical activity information and resources with people with a spinal cord injury. So a few years back, there wasn't a lot of information about just how active people with spinal cord injury actually were. And so Dr. Martin Guinness, who is the director of SCI Action Canada, got together with a group of researchers to do the SHAPE SCI study. And SHAPE stands for the study of health and activity in people and then with spinal cord injury. And this was the largest epidemiological study of people with spinal cord injury. And they actually had over 700 people with spinal cord injury enroll in this study. And what they did is they tracked these people and they, they wanted to see just how much physical activity people were doing. And the results were actually really surprising. What they found is that 54% of people with paraplegia and 52% of people with tetraplegia in Canada were doing no physical activity whatsoever. And when I say no physical activity, I really mean no physical activity. These people weren't even doing a single minute of physical activity. So this led us to think, okay, something has to be done. And research has also shown that people with spinal cord injury who are active, oh, yes. So I'll go back to the previous slide. So individuals with tetraplegia are going to be individuals okay. So tetraplegia is the new, is um is a scientific term that is used and it means the same thing as quadriplegia so some people may be more familiar with that term um, so what it is is if you have limited mobility to no mobility in all four of your extremities so if you have paraplegia then you're um, you're not going to have motor and sensory function in your lower body so in your legs and if you have tetraplegia then you're going to be um, you're, you're not going to have motor and sensory function in all four of your limbs, so both your arms and your legs. If anybody has other questions about that, feel free to type in the box. Okay, so only half of the spinal cord injury population was active. And what the, what the research has also shown is that individuals who are active are going to have a lower body mass index, a lower fat mass, 
and a lower waist circumference. And all of these are important markers that can be measured on the body that are an indication of one's disease risk. Individuals who are active are also going to have lower levels of C-reactive protein, which is a biological marker that shows up when people have disease or inflammation in their body. And individuals who are active are also, are also less likely to have insulin resistance. And so what that is, is just the lower your, your insulin resistance, the less likely you are to develop diabetes. So I see another question here. What is the rate of inactivity for able-bodied people and how did this compare? So that's a really good question. Um, the, last, the last article that I read said that approximately 30% of the able-bodied population was inactive. And so that number, um, you know, by Health Canada standards is still very low. And so um, even less people with spinal cord injury are are inactive, which is what really prompted SAI Action Canada to get started. So we know activity is important, but if we're going to, to get people to do physical activity, we really wanted to know how much physical activity we should be recommending. And this basically made us come to the conclusion that we're going to need evidence-based guidelines that show what amount of physical activity we should be prescribing to people with spinal cord injury. And so that's what SAI Action Canada did. They went through an evidence-based process to develop physical activity guidelines. And how this was done was a group of researchers um, from that, that list of institutions that I listed, they came together and they did a systematic review. So what that means is they looked through all of the literature about the effects of exercise on different fitness markers among individuals with spinal cord injury that had been done at any point in history. So these researchers collected all of this information and summarized it. They then came together with a group of fitness professionals as well as community members. So some of the community members that you had seen on that list of logos, including um, Spinal Cord Injury VC. And they all came together to come to a consensus about how much physical activity should be recommended based on the evidence and also based on what was practical. Sorry, I thought another question had come up there. So after this consensus panel, uh, our team came up with the physical activity guidelines. And this is what the physical activity guidelines, and of course that's too small for you to see, so if you have uploaded the brochure, you can open up that PDF right now. It's called the Physical Activity Guidelines for Adults with Spinal Cord Injury. And we're going to take a closer look at exactly what the guidelines say. So I'll give you a minute to do that. Okay, so you'll see that on the, um, on the left-hand side is a preamble, and on the right-hand side are the actual recommendations. So let's actually go through both sections, starting with that preamble. Okay, so the preamble says that these guidelines are appropriate for all healthy adults with a chronic spinal cord injury. So really what that means is that regardless of whether your spinal cord injury came about as a result of a traumatic or non-traumatic incident, whether you have paraplegia or tetraplegia, or you know whether you're male, female, it doesn't matter. Whoever you are, if you have a spinal cord injury, these guidelines are appropriate for you. The next line in the preamble says, the guidelines should be achieved above and beyond the incidental physical activity that we accumulate in the course of our structured rehabilitation or our daily living. And so incidental physical activity is really anything that we do in our lives that is done out of necessity. So for example, your physiotherapist or your occupational therapist may have asked you to do some exercises to increase your range of motion. Those type of exercises uh, don't count towards the guidelines because those are things that you have to do for your rehabilitation. There are also activities that you may do for daily living, like getting dressed or, or cooking at a stove. And even though these, these activities may work your muscle and you may feel like you're exerting yourself, 
th these types of activities are incidental. And so because they're part of our daily life, they're not considered um, as the time we spend doing them don't go towards the guidelines. So the type of activity that the guidelines talk about is called leisure time physical activity. And so what that is, is anything that you're choosing to do in your spare time. So if you're ever in doubt about whether or not an activity it, it counts towards the guidelines or counts as leisure time physical activity, you really want to ask yourself, am I choosing to do this? And is it in my spare time? And if the answer to that, to both of those questions is yes, then definitely counts towards the guidelines. And so examples of leisure time physical activity can be playing a sport, going for a wheel, or doing structured exercise, such as, as, as going for a, um, a, say, like an arm ergometry session, a fitness class, or even doing some strength training. And we'll talk more specifically about the different types of activities that you can do. And so lastly in the preamble it says, for those who are physically inactive, even if you do some of the physical activity that's recommended, maybe you're not achieving quite what the guidelines say, but some physical activity will br may bring some fitness benefit. So if you're the type of person who hasn't been active in a while and you look at the guidelines and it seems really intimidating to you, rest assured that you can build up to that amount of physical activity slowly and that a small amount of physical activity really can go a long way towards achieving some fitness benefit. So now that we've covered the preamble, let's take a closer look at the right-hand side of the screen where you see that chart. And that chart is actually where it lists the recommendations for how much physical activity should be done on a weekly basis. And so there are recommendations for both strength training activity as well as aerobic training activity. Let's start off by looking at the strength training recommendations. So the physical activity guidelines say that strength training activities should be done twice per week. And preferably, these should not be on consecutive days. You, you really want to give your muscles a rest. Uh, so you want a day in between, at least, to, to let them recuperate and gain all the benefits of your strength training sessions. The guidelines recommend that you gradually work up to doing three sets of eight to ten repetitions of each exercise for each major muscle group. So a major muscle group would be something like your shoulder muscles, or the fronts of your arms, or the backs of your arms. Those are just three examples of major muscle groups. So you would do one exercise for each of those groups. And of course, you have, you have more muscle groups than just that, but that, that's just an example. And when we say 8 to 10 repetitions, what we mean by one repetition is going through the complete motion of the exercise. So say, for example, we were going to do a chest press. The chest press motion starts at your chest, extends forward, and comes back to your chest. So that would count as one repetition because it's going through the exercise once. Once you've gone through the range of motion eight to 10 times, that counts as one set. So you would do three sets of eight to 10 reps of each exercise for each major muscle group. So now in terms of how hard you should be working, you should definitely be using a resistance that's difficult enough that you can barely lift it, but it is important to think of safety. So you really want to make sure you can barely lift it, but safely finish 8 to 10 repetitions. And this is where you would have to play with your weights a bit until you learn what's comfortable for you. And lastly, how you can achieve this? Well, there's a variety of ways. You can use free weights. Elastic resistance bands are great. Um, sometimes these are called TheraBands. And um, th these are great because you can attach them to a doorknob. You can um, attach them to a stable structure in your home, to a table or a chair, and make use of them anywhere. Some people also have access to a cable pulley system or a weight machine. You can even use things in your home, such as soup cans or laundry jugs. And so SCI Action Canada really wanted to take advantage of the fact that, that people often overlook the opportunity to, to do strength training in their home. And so what we did was we came up with something called the Active Home Strength Training Manuals. 
and Fernando uploaded the files for you in, in the box below. And you'll notice that there is a strength training guide for people with paraplegia, and there's a separate one for people with, with tetraplegia. And if for some reason you can't upload these PDFs, you are able at any time to go to the SCI Action Canada website and click on the Active Homes tab, and you'll be able to download these straight from our website. So let's talk a little bit more about these Active Homes manuals. The manuals walk individuals through a series of exercises that work each major muscle group in the body. So for example, I mentioned this, that um, one of the major muscle groups can be the chest, and so an exercise to work the chest is the chest press. And you'll see that the, the manual gives um, an anatomy drawing of, of what muscle is being worked, as well as some color photographs of the peer doing the exercises. And there, um, there's also a step-by-step -step listing under each exercise about all the steps you need to follow. So everything from your posture to your breathing to the range of motion you should be going through is outlined for you. We've also included some safety tips and some other resources that you may be interested in. To go along with these manuals, Sometimes people would rather see the exercise being done than read about it. And so because of that, we came up with some Active Homes videos that accompany the manuals. And, and, and again, if you go to the Active Homes section of the SCI Action Canada website, you'll be able to access these videos. They're hosted off of YouTube so that they're available at no charge to everyone that wants to see them. And so these videos do the exact same thing as the manuals. They talk about the safety tips, the anatomy, step-by-step -step process, and they actually show a peer with spinal cord injury going through the entire setup all the way through doing a complete set of, um, of the exercise. So I hope you find these useful. So now that we've talked about the strength training recommendations, let's switch over to talk about the aerobic training recommendations. So the physical activity guidelines recommend that aerobic activity should be done twice a week. So this is like strength training, which is also done twice per week. In terms of how much you should do, you should gradually increase to doing at least 20 minutes each session. So tw at least 20 minutes on each of those two days. Now, this isn't as easy for us to tell you how hard you should be working out, but what we can tell you is that it should be at a moderate to vigorous intensity. So if we look at an intensity classification, what we see is that mild intensity physical activity are activities where you're exerting very light physical effort. So these would be things that, that you could keep doing for a long time. They don't make you very tired. As we move up in intensity, we get to moderate intensity activities, and these generally require some physical effort. However, you can keep doing them for a while without getting tired. They're not exhausting. And then if we're working really hard at the top, we're at vigorous intensity. And so we're working out at a really hard, almost at our maximum, and these types of activities require a lot of physical effort. So it is difficult for you to do these for a very long time. So the physical activity guidelines recommend that you work out at a moderate to vigorous intensity. So you're definitely aiming for the higher end of that classification arrow there. And there are a number of ways, of, a number of ways you can get your aerobic activity in. As I mentioned before, you can go for a wheel or an arm cycling or arm ergometry session. You can play sports. Or you can do some water exercises like water aerobics or maybe some swimming. And I mentioned sport as a way to do aerobic exercise and actually it's a wonderful way to meet the aerobic guidelines. So SCI Action Canada has done some research about sport and what we found is that people who participate in sport are actually more likely to engage for a longer duration, so for more time, and at a higher intensity. So they're going to be much more likely to reach that moderate or vigorous intensity compared to people who don't play sport or, or who work out on their own. And people who participate in sport are actually less likely to 
fall under the seasonal fluctuations that all of us are guilty of. So it's much harder to get physical activity in the winter when the weather is not so nice out, at least here in Ontario. Maybe out there in BC it's not so bad, but I bet the people in Alberta are probably agreeing with me that the weather in the, in the wintertime is not always conducive to getting out and getting aerobic activity. So if you participate in sport, it's generally it generally takes place indoors, and so you're more likely to participate throughout the winter. And, and as well, sport is a great way for you to meet new people, so you kind of get a full, complete package when you participate in sport. And so we have a number of partners who are dedicated to help providing parasport opportunities for people with spinal cord injury. So I have some of them, some of their logos listed there. So we have the Canadian Wheelchair Sport Association, Bridging the Gap, the Active Living Alliance, and the Canadian Paralympic Committee. There's a section on the SEI Action Canada website that actually provides you with the website links to all of these organizations, as well as others. And, and the links will take you directly to their website so that you can get some more information if you're interested. So now that we know about the guidelines, let's talk about actually starting to meet them or getting in motion this year. And so I really wish it was as easy as just giving you the knowledge and you would put it to action. But at SEI Action Canada, we've recognized that it's not that easy and knowledge doesn't always equal action. And the reason is because there are so many barriers to getting physically active. So some of these barriers may be informational and some of them may relate to other things like transportation or your environment. But SEI Action Canada has developed a number of resources to help with the informational barriers that people face. So here's a screenshot of the SEI Action Canada website. And I want to draw your attention to a box that's in the bottom right hand corner. So I've outlined it on the slide in, in blue there for you. And actually, Fernando, would it be possible to send everyone the link to the SEI Action Canada homepage? I think if you click that, everyone you click that. Uh, that's, that, that particular one's a little bit difficult to do uh, via the webinar. Oh, there you go. That, that's, I was just gonna suggest that on the chat box here, is that the only place? Okay. Um, but that's yeah, that's a good start. And the other thing too is that we will be able to put also a link to SEI Action Canada on our website here. Um, and it's actually up there already in a couple different places. Yeah, because it's actually on the database. Um, but we'll work on on that part afterwards also. With you. Great. Just in case people wanted to uh, to check it out as I outline all of the resources. Okay, so as I mentioned, the bottom right-hand corner, there's going to be a listing that has several different tabs. And if I, if I make that larger for you, what you'll see is that there are a number of free physical activity resources that everybody can download if they're interested. And so we've already talked about the physical activity guidelines, and Fernando has provided you with the PDF file. And we've talked about the Active Homes manuals, and so in the, in the download box, you can see the training guide for people with paraplegia as well as for tetraplegia. So let's keep talking about some of the other physical activity resources that the SCI Action Canada website can offer for you. So we really love our SCI Get Fit Toolkit. This is a four page color brochure that gives you lots of information about physical activity and it's really there to help you implement the guidelines or to put the guidelines into action. So Fernando has put it into the file box for you. You're looking for the Get Fit Tool Kit brochure, the PDF. And if you scroll through that PDF file, what you're going to find is that there are lots of different activity examples. There's a discussion about the benefits of physical activity, some safety tips that you might wanna consider when you are engaging in physical activity, how to plan and really fit your exercise into your weekly schedule, how to overcome some of your exercise barriers, and there's also some contact information for some other resources that you might be interested in. So definitely take a look through that brochure when you get a chance.
So some research that was done a couple of years ago looked at the difference between people who received telephone-based counseling in order to get physically active and those that did not receive any telephone-based physical activity counseling. And what that research showed is that people who received the physical activity-based counseling over the telephone, so this is done completely over the phone, these people were much more likely to maintain their intentions or their motivation to be physically active, and they were much more likely to be physically active than people who did not receive the telephone counseling. And so because of this, in June 2008, SCI Action Canada launched the Get in Motion service, and you'll, you'll, you'll uh, understand why we call it Get in Motion in just a second. And so the Get in Motion service runs out of McMaster University as well as Queen's University, and we receive financial support from the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation, the Rick Hansen Institute, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. And the reason that we receive this support is that we actually offer Get in Motion at no cost to, to clients with spinal cord injury. So what's so great about Get in Motion is that it's offered at no cost across Canada, it doesn't matter what province you live in, and, and it's a physical activity counseling service for anyone with a spinal cord injury who is interested. So you may be interested in, say, finding an accessible swimming pool in your area, or perhaps you've never been physically active and, and you want to find an accessible gym. Or maybe you've been physically active for a long time and you're looking for new ways to get active or new strategies because you're getting bored with your routine. It doesn't matter how much physical activity experience you have, the Get in Motion counselor is there to talk about whatever you want to talk about. So whether it's something as simple as answering a few questions or if you really want the counselor to guide you through guide you through as you become physically active and maintain your routine, Get in Motion can help you with that. So the Get in Motion service is pretty neat. Once you enroll, you get a welcome package in the mail, and the welcome package will include the physical activity guidelines, so a hard copy of what you downloaded already. It'll also include a hard copy of the SCI Get Fit Toolkit, so that four-page color brochure. And we include some other information like safety tips, some exercises to get you started, and we include two exercise resistance bands or two TheraBands that help you get started with some strength training at home. Once you receive the welcome package, you get six months of one-on-one -on -one personalized physical activity counseling with a trained exercise counselor. So the way that it works is the exercise counselor calls you at a mutually convenient time so you never incur any long distance charges. And the counselor talks to you about whatever it is that you want to talk about. So our physical activity counselor is a trained exercise kinesiologist and he has extensive training in motivational techniques as well as behavior change strategies specifically for people with spinal cord injury. And as a surprise, our exercise counselor is actually on the call with us today, and so he's actually going to, to tune in and introduce himself. Bryce, can you say hello to everyone? Hello. Hi, Bryce. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing great. today? Can... I'm great, and how are you, Jen? Oh, we're, we're doing great in this webinar. There you are, we see you now. So Bryce, I'm just going to tell everyone some of the things that you can you can talk about during the counseling sure. session. So like I mentioned, Bryce is able to talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. So whether this is you want some more safety tips, maybe you want to know how to schedule your physical activity, maybe you want to find some accessible facilities, or maybe you need some help with overcoming some of your physical activity barriers. Bryce can help with any of these things, but I just want to note that Bryce cannot give medical advice or a specific exercise prescription. So he can help definitely help you find somebody to give you medical advice or a specific exercise prescription, but because this is done over the phone and Bryce cannot work 
one-on-one -on -one hands-on with you, he cannot provide you with medical advice or a specific exercise prescription. And so I think sometimes people wonder what actually happens during a Get In Motion call. And so Bryce and I are actually going to do a little role play to show you what your initial Get In Motion call might sound like. So I'm going to pretend that I'm a new client to Get In Motion. I just received my welcome package a few days ago, and I'm waiting for Bryce's call. Hello? <laughs> Oh, hello. hi, Jen. Uh, oh, hello? Hi, I'm here. Hi, Jen. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Who is this? Sorry, this is the... Uh, I'm uh, Bryce calling from uh, uh, the Get In Motion program, and uh, the Get In Motion office mentioned that this would be a good time for you to, uh, to meet. Is this a good time for you? Yes, actually, I was expecting your call. Thank you. Great. Um, just to get things started, I was just wondering if you received our Get In Motion welcome package. I did, and I and I was happy to see that I got two Therabands in there. I was only expecting one. Uh, great. Um, yeah, the different colors mean that there are actually different resistances for the Therabands, but uh, we can get into the Therabands a little bit later. So um, I was also just wondering sort of to get a little bit of a better idea about yourself and about what kind of um, physical activity um, you've, you've been maybe currently doing or, or what you've been doing in the recent recent past. So uh, when I mean, um, when I talk about physical activity, what I'm asking about is leisure time physical activity. So things that you don't have to do for your regular daily life, um, like going to the grocery store, or doing the dishes and stuff like that, but things that you're actually doing for the purpose of exercise on your free time. So um, if you can think to the last uh, the last seven days, how much um, leisure time physical activity would you say you've done? So you said that groceries don't count, right? Um, not really as leisure time physical activity. Well, you might see them as a bit of a bonus, but for this purpose, we're, we're talking more of a leisure time physical activity. Oh, well, in that case, Bryce, I'm afraid I haven't done any. Okay, well, that's all right. That's why we're um, we're here. We sort of uh, hope to help people get started and, and maintain their, their uh, physical activity. So um, one of the main goals that we or main tools that we use um, for the Get In Motion program is uh, the physical activity guidelines, which you would have would have been included in the uh, welcome package. So would you have a, had a chance to take a look at those? I did, and I was surprised at how much physical activity it recommends. It it seems scary. I, I'm afraid to do that much. I, I haven't been doing very much at all in the past few months, and I'm af afraid to get to do that much right now. Right. Well, it may seem like a lot right now, but um, we hope that those first two months that we, uh, that we start talking, we sort of try to start you off maybe a little bit slower than you would um, usually, but maybe with like one or two exercise sessions a week to help, you know, get your body used to some of the activities and uh, help um, keep you from injuring or getting... Um, what they call burnt out from exercise. So um, generally our first two months, we hope to sort of meet every week to help you find um, options, make some goals, get some uh, get a good routine started. Um, and then hopefully um, after a couple of weeks, you start to realize that the exercise, you're getting used to them a little bit more. And that, um, um, and of course this might be different for some, um, but it's very individualized how, how, based on how you wanna use the service. Okay, that sounds great. Great. Um, also, just to get a little bit um, more background information, I just wondered how much um, or what, what experience you have with exercise in the past, maybe either aerobic training or strength training or um, any sports that you've done in the past. Hmm. Well, I was never one for sports, but... Before my injury, I did enjoy going to some fitness classes. I haven't been able to get into that, though. I'm actually not even really sure if that's offered now that I'm in a wheelchair. Well, um, there are definitely um, some accessible, I'm sure there's some accessible um, facilities in the Vancouver area. I know of at least one YMCA in the Vancouver area. Um, and though I'm not able to visit Vancouver, I can definitely look online for any other facilities that might be accessible in the area. Um, and I have your email address, so, address, so I can I can email you the possibilities that uh, 
and and maybe even find some different programs that are that are available for you. So you mentioned the YMCA, and actually, there's a YMCA on my way home from work. So maybe I could make use of that one. Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, in that case, um, why don't we uh, try for the first week? Maybe make a goal of it to uh, to have you stop into the YMCA for a tour. Maybe try. Um, if they'll allow you to try some things out to see, you know, how accessible it is for yourself and, and um, maybe ask them about membership costs and, and maybe if they even know about other community options. That's a good I idea, Bryce. I can um, actually, I think I might be able to stop in there on my way home from work tomorrow. I can let you know what they say the next time we chat. Sounds great. So um, would uh, the same time be uh, good for you to talk next week or uh, is there a different time that, that works better for you? This time next week should work fine. Thank you. Sounds great. And we can talk about what you uh, were able to try at the Y and we can uh, maybe see what else we were able to find in the, in the area. Thank you, Bryce. Sounds great. See you later, Jen. Bye-bye. So I see a comment in the chat box there that says you can also contact SCI BC info line for details on accessible fitness facilities in BC. Yes, we're, we're um, becoming increasingly aware of all of the wonderful information that SCI BC has on their info line and we have a link to it on our SCI Action Canada homepage. So thank you for bringing that point up, Prince, Prince George I believe it's from. Okay, so that was a, just an example of what your first counseling session might sound like. Let's move down the road. Let's pretend I've been having counseling now for about two months and I've, and I've established a bit of a routine. So this is what a follow-up call might sound like. Hello? Hello? Oh, hi. Oh, is hi, this, Jen. Is this Bryce? Yeah, this is Bryce. How have you been? Good, Bryce. How are you doing? Oh, not too bad. Um, I uh, I was just uh, hoping to catch up with you to um, see how you've managed to do uh, to do with your uh, exercise uh, in the past uh, couple of weeks. Well, Bryce, I think you would be proud of me. I took your advice and I thought of of um, incorporating some physical activity into my work day. 